We burn sage for purification, for good intention, to clear a space, clear our hearts and our minds. Then we send prayers, we ask for wise counsel, good intent, the highest interest of ourselves and others, so that we act wisely, do less harm. So that's how I start this and every communication, every video. Um, I want to do a video series on uh, endangered fathers, which is really endangered families, for being honest, but um, going through what I've gone through with the family courts and being a man, a male, um, my focus happens to be on fathers. And because of the state of what I think is dire times for fathers in America um, specifically. And so there should be attention acknowledged and directed very specifically at fathers as endangered species, as uh, a group under attack, a people with no value currently in this culture, systematically, legally, and socially. So. Um, the Endangered Fathers series uh, was going to be a little more maybe what a podcast or blog talk kind of thing would be um, where I'm just speaking my mind and getting things off my chest that are maybe more personal to my life, more specific to me, um, but certainly that I would hope hold good content uh, for the collective, for others, and to put any of my private business public on YouTube, on any of the social media, um, to have some sort of point other than just shopping for likes and uh, the tendency for us to just want to be in the spotlight, we want people to like us, validate us, which is part of it too, especially when you have a cause that you feel passionate for. So um, just acknowledging that, getting that out of the way, setting my intention and um, coming off of a day where a court order went through against me um, in the name of attorney's fees for the mother, for petitioner. And uh, today I got sued for the second year in a row uh, for $18,000 roughly for defending myself. I have 15 days a year with my daughter and uh, just to try to get those and to so-called fight in court, um, I was penalized in the likes of just under $20,000. So um, it's a very telling reality. It's a very telling order. It's a very telling experience I've had in the family court process. So to start the Endangered Father series that I want to do, I thought, have my first one and start out talking about value and to be valued or devalued in this case as a father, as a man, uh, legally, culturally, and otherwise, um, and just reflecting on my day and uh, going through an experience that for me blatantly communicates what type of value I hold. Um, especially legally, but legally is supposed to be a representation of how we feel collectively, socially. So that mixed with my real, real experience with the community socially and those that have been impacted or not impacted by my situation, by my case, by the reality and what they bear witness to, um, and the difference between the men reaction and the women's reaction and is there a difference so but all that certainly communicates your importance your value your place um, with individuals with collectives with groups um, 
with society at large and also in this case and in, in many cases specifically in the legal system in the courts so um, and I just got to reflecting about value the importance of holding value with your family with your tribe with your community in society just period value is such an important part uh, thinking of children me being in family court, all this fighting over trying to be involved in my daughter's life, um, and the value we try to instill in them, why to make them good people, good productive members of our families, of society at large, so we create optimal human beings, the best that we can. You know, nobody wants to create a drug addict or somebody that suffers from depression or a criminal or somebody that is a taker instead of a giver, a lever, as me and my daughter are reading in the book Ishmael, which covers takers versus levers, which is givers versus takers. I mean, what do you want to be? What's your legacy going to be? You know, what is your, what is your culture going to be? What are you going to pass down to your children? What are your family values and morals going to be? What do you stand for? What do you believe in? What do you act on based on principle? And so um, with value comes healthy, productive people, you know, people that feel appreciated, people that want to be givers, that want to give more. And of course, that leads into the crisis we have for men and males and fathers specifically, but males all around, in my opinion, and the more I dig into understanding how I could be in this position, how I have no rights, how nobody seems to care, how um, if they do care, there's no real vehicle or movement or momentum or voice that's, you know, culminating that sentiment, much less into anything tangible that can help me in my case, that could have saved me the $150,000 expense just to try to be in my daughter's life, much less the penalties I faced, which now are um, about sixty to seventy thousand uh, dollars for, you know, simply attempting to defend myself and assert my rights and my position and my claim and my beliefs and ultimately my position as a father in my daughter's life. I've been penalized through reasonable attorney's fees that I have to pay to mother even though I had my own attorney's fees. Now I can't afford an attorney and now I'm just penalized that she can't afford an attorney and that I should, I'm not sure what I should, they think I should have done, just acquiesced and rolled over. And as her attorney put it, I failed to see the light, see mother's position. And um, there's a system of power that backs that and agrees with that. And so just thinking about value that, court orders specifically determine value, fairness, what's right, what's lawful, what's moral, and ethical. The commentary around me was all around that, that, you know, I treated this attorney in a way that challenged his ethics and morality, which I do openly. I think he is a terrible human and doesn't follow any of the ethics and principles that you should use when uh, representing somebody in propria persona, pro se, however they want to put it. Someone that doesn't have an attorney. Someone whose child is involved. They're a parent. It's the adversarial courts. I've already done the videos on just how nasty and negative and unnecessary that that whole adversarial attorney system is. It's, to me, it's shocking. It's shocking that uh, intelligent, educated, um, so-called prestigious people could back a system like what I've gone through. And if mine's the exception to the rule, then there should be avenues of recourse and redress and something that would um, shine light on the exception to the rule. But I don't think that's the case. I don't think I'm the exception to the rule. I think this is a social, cultural phenomenon legally as well, that devalues hold, holds no value for fathers, generally speaking. Absol uh, obviously, absolutes are dangerous, but statistics are statistics. And 
we're getting close to absolutes when it comes to father's custodies or lack thereof and turning them into paychecks and the absolute white knight savior of the government becoming the the replacement father and social social you know socialism social programs that then take money from the public at large and from fathers specifically obviously and then redistribute that with profit in there of course there's fees and profiting going on um, and it's just a, it's a destructive system and today reflecting on what it speaks clearly to me and my value um, which is no value. 15 days, you can't pass on anything 15 days a year to a child. You can't pass on your morals. You can't establish a healthy program of discipline with teaching, with nurturing, and all the things that true parenting uh, encapsulates. You know, you, it's, it's silly. Anyone that would argue that you could pass down your culture, your ideals, your values, your morals, your actions and tendencies, the muscle memory of what you live day to day uh, in 15 days annually, I have to take as insane. And then if you justify um, 15 days as holding value within that, it just starts to get really absurd trying to rationalize, much less argue, put myself in their shoes, any of it. Um, which it's the death of common sense. That's why we know they don't hold value for you if they think 15 days is okay, if they deny all the statistics of what happens when you remove a father from children's lives, much less biological parents. I'm adopted. I learned about my biology through state, through court papers, through reading through the foster system and the adoption system. And it's a really strange thing to have your ancestral history be taught to you so um, foreignly, so removed from nature, from two biological parents creating offspring, nurturing them, teaching them, guiding them, all, all the, what family values, at least my family values, and what I thought this country, in America at least, but far past America, you would think, um, but I think America and the Western culture certainly exemplifies those family values and those morals and the best social system that we've seen, um, that it speaks the opposite of that. It speaks that you can reduce men to nothing more than a paycheck, a financial figure, and an unsustainable one. What we've gone through is, it's ridiculous. Spending what would be a child's college tuition in the first two years of that child's life on from both parents, is it's a travesty. It's unconscionable. We know, I know how I could have invested that money. It would have been so ethical just to tell me we don't value you as a father in the same way we value mothers. So we're going to give all custody to the mother. I shouldn't have fought. That's what they should have communicated to me. That you would need something miraculous to change a typical judge's opinion in America to that of shared custody, a 50-50, of inclusion of two parents, the best that we can, unless there's something obvious like abuse or you know, some real ill will, mental conditions, um, you know, a handful of things that we could argue would warrant any intervention into private family life, much less the removal of a parent as so absolutely as is typical in this country. So, you know, I went from 2% time, which was four weekends a year, eight days a year. I bumped up to 15 days a year. My daughter's going to be four. I mean, this is the most, one of the most influential times in a child's life, you know, when the reptilian brain is still working, the time that they won't even remember a cognate with their active, you know, everyday memory as an adult. And yet it's so important 
for the conditioning, the teaching of, you know, being comfortable with male energy, being secure and nurtured and supported and taught. Um, the same as female, mother, father, why the both roles are so important. And God forbid you can't keep that family dynamic civil and organized with your priorities and you have to involve the state or the state get in, gets involved for whatever reason. Um, certainly we'd want that, any third party, to be truly holding those ideals in the forefront, the, the benefit and the necessity of a father, the benefit and the necessity of a mother, and beyond, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, you know, and the, it's not just that, it's all the factors that are going into the best interest of the child. It's such a, when I hear that phrase and I know what I've gone through in court, it's so infuriating and it's so insulting and demeaning to my intelligence and my beliefs and intentions as a loving man who brought children into this world intentionally. And I feel good about that. I, I, I love the idea of continuing the species, of being proud about your culture. I love the, the diversity that we do have, not in the new left liberal diversity, social justice warrior that we see, in the sense that I love, I come from a place where, you know, Milwaukee is super diverse and it's not all chaos. And I, I agree with European, them wanting to preserve their lineage and their culture and we had a thing in Milwaukee called Folk Fest where you go and it was nations, Swedish nations, French, you know, all the European nations, African nations, like Latin nations, American nations, like it was great. It wasn't this homogenized, everybody trying to be everybody else. Like you say, you don't go to a French restaurant for a Mexican burrito. That's because we love what these different historical cultures have brought to the table. And we show that value by preservation, by acknowledgement, by that's why I'd want to go to France to experience French culture, right? I want to go to Africa to experience African culture. I want to go to America to experience the smorgasbord of indigenous to the immigration culture to even the industrialized, what a lot of the Europeans brought to this, the Western world. It's, for me, it's not all black and white. I've always been straight up about that. I don't think it's just bad this, white devil this, black, you know, they can't get their shit together. That is the, the too polarizing. And then we, all that divide and conquer the Willie Lynch and that's to me the point of trying to have compassion in your heart, kindness and appreciation for the diversity that exists as well as for the ideals that we're working for as humans. So that gets kind of broad from this typical thing in court that we're seeing and our value. And so I guess I'm going to end with this, that it's an interesting thing to have gone through that. And I, I know I'm a strong human being because I haven't broke from this. Um, and I know why from my values, my ideals, the challenges I've overcome to get where I'm at now. And most importantly, the family and the community and the support that I have through Creator, as well as real people here on the planet that believe in me, that know my life, that can validate, as well as challenge what we go through together. And so I think it's a hard world, typically, just being born on, into this meat suit and having to find identity and meaning and purpose and answers for pain and suffrage and otherwise an inspiration for the beauty that we see and the beauty that we know we could be. And the value's a part of that. And we all question our value with lovers, with people that we date, with our parents, with siblings, at work, with different 
careers and jobs and jobs that we've had. Um, we're constantly good people that reflect on self and their performance and their value. It's natural to think of what that is. While as compassionate human beings, as parents ourselves, as the continuation of all that's ever been, we understand the importance of valuing those that we love and why we show that we appreciate that we value them, why we give thanks at all. Giving thanks is a necessary part of what makes any of this worth it. And that includes acknowledgement, that includes judgment, that includes what we value, which implies what we don't. And so it's one thing to go through that intellectually, emotionally, generally speaking. But it's been a whole nother thing to have that shown to me so very specifically, as clear as day, to be shown that you hold no value is different than this philosophical contemplation I've gone through most of my life where I ebb and flow with different people, different positions of power, different circumstances that may or may not have more or less impact over what it even matters in my life and its impact on my life. But being in family court, it's a clear position of power. It's clear figures of power. And to have people that really have impact and power over your life and a say, they have the ultimate say in any relationship I'm going to have with my daughter, at least for a long time, till she's a cognizant, sentient human that can make true, wise decisions on her own which, who knows, it, that ebb and flows as we mature as humans. Some do it sooner than others, but when you're a parent who's been removed from your child's life for all intents and purposes, it's, it's a terrifying, deep, painful, frightening projection, wondering and hoping all the what ifing that you do while you're just missing out on time on what should be. So that's my sentiment to those that have gone through it, male or female, but certainly in this country, the predominant men that have been shown specifically that they, don't, they aren't valued. I would say that we don't value, but I value you. I value fathers. I value the family structure. I value mothers. And I've been advocating for women my whole life. That's why it's, it's hitting so deep to understand that that sentiment, I don't think, is really reciprocated and shared. That a lot of my female cohorts and the cistern out there that are all pro-women, that it, I understand now why they're not shouting pro-man, because a lot of them truly aren't. A lot of them truly don't have that value clarified in their philosophy and solidified in their heart. And that's why I don't hear them advocating. And that's why I think culturally, socially, and legally, we're showing that I have no value in my daughter's life. Not because of what I want, but because of what is in this society. These courts don't value me. And the reaction from the populace at large does not value me. And they're showing me that, specifically and legally. And it's been a hard pill to swallow. So my first ep episode is on value. It's one thing to contemplate that you might not have value or be less valuable or fluctuate on that spectrum, but to be shown you're truly worth nothing more than a paycheck, than a reduction to money, does not reflect my culture, does not reflect what I value, does not reflect what I want to contribute and be, and this is a starting place. Do people share my sentiment? If they do, how could I be in this position? How could I be shown so blatantly by the state of Oregon that 15 days with a father 
is fair and equitable and the best interest of a child. It's mind-boggling to me. I've had to do everything in my power to compose myself to do this video today because um, I fluctuate between very angry and very sad, hopeless. <clears throat> so I, I want to do videos where I'm not just trying to project the best image of myself when I have it together, when I'm having a more positive day. Um, and this is me doing that today. Because an hour ago, when I'm crying and I'm angry and I can't find anything positive to say, that's why I turned to the sage and meditation and stilling my heart and my mind and asking for wise counsel. I find it hard to believe that this judge does that. I, I don't just find it hard to believe. I know that this attorney doesn't do that. And I know the mother of my child, my one child, does not do that. The mother of my other child was a prime example for me, a family values of what we're supposed to be doing, and that's how we've maintained a beautiful co-parenting relationship where we break bread together, we care about each other because we chose to create family together. And I might not believe in marriage through the state, um, but I believe in the structure of man, woman, child and the benefit that that um, overwhelmingly has to children and society at large. And that's why I believe we're endangered fathers. And that truly is a sentiment of the same endangered families which came first. The mothers were attacked in a whole nother way to even get to this place where you can have such a predominant sentiment that has very little value for fathers. MGTOW, we can get into all that, men go in their own way. I get it, I love women. It's just like a damaged child and the damage that men have been trying to heal and why I stood by men. I love men. You know, I st I'm a man. I want to be acknowledged for my properties and my values. So the men I've known in this world, I don't give up on them either. The, especially the ones that have more demons than others. And... Um, you know, we'll, we'll do f further comments and videos on the MGTOW and the, the reaction to Me Too, hashtag Me Too's and all that we're seeing culminating that's Willie Lynch, that's dividing us, that is still, MGTOW is still the destruction of the family. Like, how do we, it, that's why, how could I ever be MGTOW? How could I truly separate, even if there's only 10% that we say that are good women, I'm going to work hard to get them as allies and as part of my community as my mate. I already feel, you know, blessed because I have a good relationship. And I have some women in my life that truly reflect my values and um, make me feel val valued and validated and appreciated. And so I know that exists. I'm not about to give up on that because that's the destruction of society, of everything. So, just as I'm never giving up on my children, I'm always going to be there for them no matter what they do, no matter how, if they ever get off the right path, the middle road, the red road, and any other road that we define as being moral and mature and ethical, ideal. So, I'm not giving up on society either. I'm not giving up on Creator. I'm not giving up on you not giving up on me. So that's why I'm going to keep problem solving, keep advocating for PMA, positive mental attitude, and probably do some more videos and social public outbursts that get my opinion and my two cents part of the melting pot as we try to collectively find grace be productive and healthy and quit the war and, you know, get to dialoguing over debating immediately with our family and friends and globally. 
so that we can stop shooting at each other on so many levels. So, endangered fathers, I see you, I recognize you, I honor you and I value you, and I validate what we've been going through. And I'm here to stand by you and work with you, offer you encouragement and support, not start an echo chamber that's just dives into victim mentality, complaining, right? Solution oriented is complains with solutions. So we can have our complaints, but we gotta be complaining with good intent, not just to be griping. So that's what I'm trying to do. I don't know how we change this besides getting people to care and even understand that they're is a war against families, that there's a war against men. We already know there's a war against women. We're with that. I don't want there to be war against anybody. Minimize it as much as we can. There's always going to be discordance and polarity. So we just try to navigate that with as much grace and minimization of the violence that we can. So we're going to keep trying to do that. So peace and love. My name is MCAD, a.k.a. Rad Dad, and I guess this is the Endangered Father series, part one. We'll see if it goes to a part two. If the people value it, if I get value from it, it probably will. If not, it'll become one of a billion other things that just go out into the cosmos. So, peace and love. You can get some music for the movement rhymesforthetimes.com that's my website that's my passion and my project um, and uh, you know be good to yourself be good to the world peace and love it's all coming together right here now it's all coming together right here now it's all coming together right here yeah. Who's that? It's love, can you feel it coming through that? Conscious revolutionary music. Yeah, you can feel it.